Okay, we're back, we're live, we're here in the core of downtown in Honolulu at the Pioneer Plaza. And uh, every so often we, we talk to Europe because we like the time difference, although it's, it's tough on the people in Europe. Um, and today we're talking again to our correspondent in Brussels, who is Gari Kandakar. She's with Free Day, which is a think tank in Europe. There's uh, its principal office in Madrid and another office in Brussels, and she is in the Brussels office, and she covers, uh, what do you cover, Gowrie, exactly? Um, I'm the head of the Asia program, so I look at EU relations with Asia. And, and you, Asia like, you like to stay up late. <laughs> Only for you, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I like to come in early for you, okay. <laughs> So uh, we, uh, Gary and I were corresponding about what we're going to do on this, uh, this show. And let's call this uh, Think Tech Talks West of Asia. We start out with Asia and sort of move to a global position on this. And then, bingo, we're in Europe. And, um, and, and, and because, uh, you know, we've had storms, and there are storms in this time of climate change and El Nino, we're calling this show Storms of Another Kind because it occurs to both Gowrie and me that there are a lot of storms in the world. Um, and we want to sort of get a, uh, what do you want to call it, a, 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 a differential, uh, an arbitrage, if you will, and how people feel in Europe and India, I suppose, because Gowrie just came back from India, um, and how they feel in the U.S., sort of expand our consciousness about the reaction around the world to some of these headlines. And uh, I guess we have a bunch of headlines because there are a lot of storms in the world these days. Let me just take one that comes to mind first, and that is ISIS in the, in the Middle East. Uh, ISIS in this country is, is on CNN, it's on cable all the time. Uh, people are very afraid. They're afraid of the ISIS guys coming across the Mexican border. They're afraid of the <laughs> ISIS guys going into uh, points that you wouldn't expect, like Lebanon, for example. They're afraid of the notion that the ISIS guys are actually recruited in, in Britain and other parts of Europe. Uh, and they're afraid of the brutality. Uh, and nobody fully understands. You know, it's like the, the Redcoats and the revolutionaries back in the American Revolutionary War. The, the Redcoats were playing on formal rules, and the revolutionaries didn't have so many rules. And now we find the ultimate extension of that. ISIS has no rules. The only rule is to take territory, terrify people, and so on. And um, anyway, point is that a lot of people in this country are very concerned about it and uh, where it's going to wind up. I'm really curious how you feel about that, how Free Day feels, if it has a feeling, and how the average European person uh, feels about ISIS. Sure. So let me start by saying that it's been somewhat of a seemingly apocalyptic summer, um, although nothing can deter the Europeans from their summer break. And uh, in Brussels, everything was very quiet, all the officials were away. Um, but still, uh, there was this kind of gloom, you know, a dark cloud, like you say. Um, over, uh, over everything, given all the, the number of crises that we hear. Um, I think it is, 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 a, is a big threat. I mean, it, uh, as such, there is a lot of Islamophobia that's been growing around in Europe. Well, for good reasons, and well, it's not a good thing anyways, but, um, but there have been terrorist uh, attacks that have been shown on TV, uh, that have struck the heart of Europe, in the UK, Madrid, uh, Paris as well. Uh, and so people are really uh, scared of what Islamic terrorism could bring. Um, now, ISIS uh, taking over vast swathes of I uh, Iraq and Syria is something uh, quite incredible. They ha they're quite well resourced, and they have a uh, uh, they have a very different, uh, more crude, uh, cruel ideology than even Al Qaeda. So, so they're they're um, uh, a group of hearts. Um, and you're right, there are so many uh, Europeans that, uh, that have joined ISIS, uh, mainly uh, the young Muslims uh, in Europe that get radicalized and have traveled um, to, to, to Iraq uh, via Turkey uh, or to Syria via Turkey. 
uh, and then participating here, yeah, and this also includes, and you might be surprised, uh, young girls uh, who go to uh, Iraq and get married to ISIS fighters. So it, the people on the street even are quite aware of the risk. What what is the process of the radicalism? I mean, that is kind of interesting. You know, Europe is a first world place. Europe, you can have a nice life, you can get a job and an apartment and uh, even buy a car, forgive me for that. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, why, why would you want to become radical with all those great opportunities hanging, hanging on the tree around you uh, and put yourself uh, in harm's way, uh, you know, uh, throw off the, uh, you know, the benefits of Western life um, and, and, and uh, risk your life every day, every moment. Uh, by by working in ISIS, which is a pretty dangerous business. Sure. What well, happens to the young man or woman who who joins this? I mean, what what's the process? Sure. Um, when it all begins with the identity crisis, because most of the youth are second or third generation immigrants, they're born in uh, in Europe, they've grown up here, they're quite well assimilated into the culture. Yet, their own families have uh, kept them culturally very close to their um, uh, uh, countries of origin. And this, uh, this, this does not really allow them to uh, really be European. They still have a very uh, Muslim identity. Um, and even though their own parents might not be extremists, they do turn out to be quite extremists because they're somewhere in the middle. You see, um, and they don't get uh, the whole uh, spectrum of freedoms that um, that most European uh, Christian Europeans or atheist Europeans would perhaps. Um, and so, when they read uh, all the atrocities in the news, um, and the media is of course uh, uh, quite vibrant in Europe, when they read all these atrocities happening in. Uh, in Muslim, uh, in non-Muslim countries, or to Muslims uh, elsewhere, um, it triggers something inside them. And most of the radical radicalization that's been taking place has happened in um, in mosques, in madrasas, um, where these young Muslims have gone to study. And it really doesn't matter on the the amount of education you had or um, or your background. You might come from a very rich family. Uh, their most recent case was of a 20-year-old, very brilliant um, girl, a Scottish girl, who studied in a private uh, school, even, uh, which is quite expensive. And she uh, traveled to, to Iraq uh, via Turkey and Syria and is now married with, a, with a ISIS jihadist. So it really doesn't change where you come from, your type of upbringing. Uh, only the poorer sections are not um, prone to radicalization. So it's quite a... If the, her parents were recently saying that if this could happen to our daughter, it could happen to anyone. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the people on the street in Europe think that um, one day ISIS will come to Europe. Uh, it will work its way up somehow, and uh, or it, it will appear in, a, in some kind of terror attack in Europe. Um, I mean, is there... I, mean, I can tell you, in the U.S., there are people who fear that directly. Uh, do, you, do you find that this is the same case in, in Europe? Well, um, somehow, yes. I mean, they don't fear that ISIS will migrate to Europe or will expand the, the so-called caliphate that they're trying to be to Europe as such right now. They recognize very well that ISIS is trying to create a stronghold in Iraq. So the fear, the, the fear uh, of the, the common man on the street is not that ISIS will invade them. Uh, that said, there is a fear of returning jihadists and uh, countries like the UK, uh, uh, France, um, Germany even are taking this very seriously because there are jihadist fighters or radicalized youth from these countries who have flown uh, to join ISIS and they're now coming back. Uh, and um, and they would uh, try to lead their lives uh, uh, as they did, or try to bo uh, make plans to um, carry out bomb attacks. It's it's not known. 
So what the UK has done of recent is that is, is that they would deport um, the um, the returning jihadists. They would uh, take away their British passports, but that only applies to those having double nationality. Mm -hmm. Well, what about the uh, what about the, the the countries in Europe? Are they? Um, do you think they're on a path to action? I mean, there's been a fair amount of discussion here about whether President uh, Barack Obama is is on a path to action. I mean, when he was asked a week ago what, was, what his plan was on ISIS, he said he hadn't formulated a plan yet, uh, which uh, it led a lot of people to criticize him for not having a plan. But this is a hard thing to plan. And, I'm, and I wonder what kind of reaction you get in Europe, and I wonder the leaders of state and you know the people who comment on on the policies of the leaders of state uh, are saying that Europe should act by itself, that it, it should, uh, you know, it should join in this bombing campaign, the, the drone campaign. Uh, it should take other affirmative action. Uh, there should be a coalition of some kind. Are they, is the European, are the European powers on a path to taking affirmative action about ISIS? Well, actually, today uh, there was a NATO summit. NATO is the North Atlantic uh, Treaty Organization, uh, and the summit took place in Wales. Uh, and NATO uh, had the ISIS uh, question very high on the agenda. It dominated most of the proceedings today. Now, there would not be a so-called NATO uh, action uh, or any NATO um, plan against ISIS uh, like there was in Afghanistan because most of the countries in, in Europe and, uh, and I'm sure in the US as well uh, have become quite war wary. They don't want boots on the ground. Uh, and so um, there has been, uh, NATO as such has, uh, has aimed at getting more support from the international community. Uh, the UK did uh, send uh, aircraft uh, to uh, to, to, to Iraq, but it was mainly to rescue the Yazidi communities that were trapped. Um, that said, the EU is mulling over uh, a cordon sanitaire, which means uh, a safe zone, which would be the size of uh, the UK itself uh, in Iraq, um, basically to offer protection uh, to the local people and to allow um, aid that would go in and out of the country. Mm. Uh, Gary, we're going to take a short break. That's Gary Kandekar, uh, uh, who is with Free Day, which is a think tank in Europe, which with his principal office in Madrid, and she's associated with the Brussels office covering uh, Asian affairs in Europe. Uh, we'll be right back after this short break. Aloha. Hello. My name is Hong Jiang, and I host Think Tech Asia every Tuesday afternoon at 4 p.m. At our show, we talk about issues that are important in Asia, such as environment, culture, history, religion. We broadcast live, and we're also on Olalo 54. Make sure to tune in, and we'll see you there. Thank you. Goodbye. Aloha. Hello. My name is Hong Jiang. And I host Think Tech Asia every Tuesday afternoon at 4 p.m. At our show, we talk about issues that are important in Asia, such as environment, culture, history, religion. We broadcast live, and we're also on Olalo 54. Make sure to tune in, and we'll see you there. Thank you. Goodbye. Aloha, my name is Carlos Juarez, and I host Global Connections here in Think Tech Hawaii's broadcast series. We broadcast live at Thursdays at 2 o'clock and also on Olelo 54. Make sure to join us here where we bring the world to Hawaii and we also bring the Hawaii to the world. Okay. We look forward to seeing you here on Global Connections. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here on West of Asia talking about storms of another kind. Uh, and, I, you know, if you think of ISIS, Gary, this is Gary Kandekar with Free Day in Brussels, joins us at, what is it, uh, 1220 uh, in the middle of the night. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you think of that, you think of Al-Qaeda. And Al-Qaeda announced that it wants to do something in, in, in South Asia now. So Al-Qaeda is also on the rise. And although a lot of people, you know, fear Al-Qaeda less than they do ISIS, uh, that's troubling, too. What, what's, um, 
what's the reaction in Europe about the spread, not only of ISIS, but Al-Qaeda? And I suppose I could lump in there the whole Gaza affair with Israel. I mean, how do people feel in Europe about this? Is this something far away, or do they see it as a threat? Yes. Um, the first thing I would like to continue with the talk was, uh, and we didn't mention it, was the horrific beheading, and that really sent an electric shock across Brussels. Uh, everyone is quite petrified about uh, about these, uh, these beheadings that have been happening to journalists. Yes. And journalists like James Foley, for instance, who was actually telling the story of the people, so he wasn't um, he wasn't a biased journalist at all uh, on the side of uh, the government or anything. Um, that is quite shocking. So what the European countries are doing now is also to um, to arm the Kurdish uh, tribes, the, the the Kurdish fighters, the Peshmerga. Uh, who are fighting the ISIS. So the strategy in Europe at the moment is to, to arm the Peshmerga forces. Now there are some in Europe who feel that this might not be such a good idea because you know you don't know how events turn out and how in whose uh, hands uh, these arms might go. Anyways, so you have the ISIS and then you have the Al-Qaeda which by the way announced today uh, a South Asia branch uh, targeted at the entire South Asia region from Afghanistan right away to uh, Myanmar uh, and India would be a huge focus of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And now you have these two Islamic terrorist organizations and at the same time you have the Gaza conflict. So people in Europe, uh, although they make a difference, the local person on the street, the locals um, see that yes, on the one hand there is a there is a Muslim community that is crying for help, but on the other hand they're also killing. So how do you weigh these two? Um, uh, of course the the Gaza attacks have been uh, have been um, have been quite uh, painful to see and um, but I mean uh, most in Europe have also have also understood the problem that Israel faces, even though it does not lose many lives as, as, uh, as those in Gaza do, unfortunately. Um, but Israel does face the threat of Hamas. Uh, for the moment, uh, some countries like Spain, for instance, have, uh, have stopped uh, sending weapons to Israel. And the UK might follow suit, but if you can see Voting in the in the UN uh, uh, in the UN General Assembly, um, all the European uh, Union countries have abstained from sending uh, an inquiry to Israel. Um, that said, the EU is one of the largest donors to Gaza, and it does have a plan to to uh, to stabilize the, the region. Uh, it it does guarantee that uh, that at, uh, Hamas would. Uh, not attack uh, Israel. That uh, that that uh, enough freedom, sufficient freedom, uh, can uh, can be brought to the oppressed societies, uh, those that do not have access to um, to food, regular food and water channels. So the EU does have a plan, and they were quite uh, active also in the uh, in the truce negotiations that were taking place in Egypt. What about uh, these outbreaks of anti-Semitism in Europe? You know, it's uh, clearly a direct result of the Gaza experience, and well, in the trouble in general in the Middle East. But uh, you know, do you have a, a sense of how people feel about that? Are they outraged? Are they less than outraged? Uh, do, do people understand what's happening, that you could have these uh, anti-Semitic attacks? Yes, uh, anti-Semitic attacks have been on the rise, and it's really, it is also scary, because one of them just happened in Brussels uh, a few weeks ago, or a month ago, and Brussels is such a quiet city. Now, uh, people tend to, uh, to mix up countries with religious communities, which I really think is, is an error, but this is my personal opinion. It's, um, uh, Israel's actions are, are mixed with the, that of the entire community, communities which have contributed quite a lot to Europe as well. Um, now, um, these attacks 
are, are, are taking, have taken place mainly um, by angry youth. Again, most of them might even belong to those that, uh, that feel uh, solidarity with the Muslim countries. Maybe they are Muslim themselves, uh, but the, the identities are not known. Uh, um, as such, and I've not carried out a, a large-scale study on into that. Um, but yes, it's, it's a mixing up of emotions uh, and identities. Um, yeah, it's, it's a sad uh, pattern of events, and I think more should be done by the European government to uh, to create more awareness uh, about the situation. Yeah. Let's let's move to Pakistan for a minute. Pakistan seems to be, uh, you know, under threat of instability, if you will. Uh, what I what I've seen and heard is that the actual number of demonstrators demonstrating against the government, uh, not that great. Uh, Seventy, eighty thousand in a country of, she was uh, must be, must be uh, at least a few hundred million. Um, and numerically, it's not that many people, and yet it hits the press, and it it, it doesn't bode well for Pakistan doesn't bode well for the world view of Pakistan, and Pakistan's a nuclear power. Uh, one likes to see a nuclear power remain stable. So uh, what, what is the European, and for that matter, since you're acquainted with it, what is the uh, Indian perception of this trouble in Pakistan right now? Uh, so, um, it's, this is only a 45-minute show, Gauri. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, well, you know, instability in Pakistan has become quite the norm. Actually, it's uh, we were, everybody in India was really happy to see that uh, there was a stable uh, government in Pakistan led by Nawaz Sharif, who has quite good uh, links with um, with uh, with the BJP government that uh, that was there before he was ousted. Uh, Nawaz Sharif, that is. Uh, now, Imran Khan, who is, uh, who is an, a leader of uh, another opposing party and, um, and, a, and a Muslim cleric, Tahir al Sadri, have, have led this uh, uh, large protest marches uh, through the capital uh, asking for Nawaz Sharif to step down because they say uh, there was election fraud. Um, and yet, it is destabilizing in the region uh, because. Uh, the military as well is is not really being helpful to the democratically elected government, which Pakistan is desperately in need of, and this comes amid amid um, amid the chances for uh, for peace, which uh, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, had extended this opportunity. He had invited Nawaz Sharif to uh, to attend his wedding in ceremony. Uh, and he had held talks with him personally, and everything seemed to be going well. Um, now, the second problem arises, and this is quite big as well, is that Al Qaeda, led by uh, Ayman al Zawari, uh, who, is, uh, who succeeded Osama bin Laden, uh, he announced the creation of a South Asia uh, branch uh, for, uh, of Al Qaeda that would target South Asia. That would uh, uh, vindicate uh, Muslims and the ill treatment of Muslims in India, Bangladesh, uh, Burma, uh, and create a caliphate. Uh, so he matches the offer of ISIS to create a caliphate. Um, now, most of the people in the region see the development of Al Qaeda's uh, branch as uh, as a way to to compete for recruits with ISIS but also competing for funding. And if Al-Qaeda would emerge as a strong, uh, or Al-Qaeda's South Asia branch would emerge as a strong unit, I think it would spell disaster for Pakistan, especially given that it's a nuclear-armed country. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. You know, the, the thought that uh, Al-Qaeda uh, is um, c kind of taking aggressive steps to build up its uh, constituency in competition as a result of the success of ISIS. That's really interesting. There are two competing caliphates. <laughs> and and, and Al-Qaeda wants, wants to catch up to ISIS. It feels, uh, it feels outclassed by ISIS. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm sorry to make a joke about it, but it is kind of humorous when you look at it as two competing caliphates. 
It's true. I, I, I was hearing, I, I listen to John Stewart quite often, uh, and I quite like him. And, and he, what he said was actually true that uh, ISIS was literally kicked out of Al Qaeda because Al Qaeda thought they were too violent. And it's true. Um, it's a splinter organization. Although that said, you know, Al Qaeda has, thanks to U.S. efforts, has become so weak at the moment. Yeah. Uh, they, they're really weakened. Uh, and they do also c compete with a number of uh, terrorist groups in South Asia. So India has a, has its own, you know, palette of uh, terrorist groups to deal with, and, and Al Qaeda just adds another one. Yeah. So. Well, you know what it sounds like. It sounds like a, a big vacuum, where there's no Western power, including the United States, willing to step in and get on the ground and do something. Uh, I don't think anybody's impressed with the drones and and bombing, although that, that can certainly wreak havoc in a given area. Um, but, uh, you know, I think what, what we have, and I'd be interested in your reaction, you know, as a sort of uh, perception of the European reaction, um, what we have is a vacuum where these competing uh, caliphates uh, are stepping into a vacuum with little or no prospect of being stopped. Uh, there's nobody going to stand there and say, you can't do that. So they feel emboldened to do what they want. Um, and I wonder what people's thought is about that. Are, are people in Europe waiting for the United States to solve this problem? Uh, or are they, are they given up on that possibility? Well, Europe has always followed the lead of the U.S., so there's nothing surprising about that. I don't think the EU or European countries would do anything unilaterally without consulting the U.S., so that's, uh, mm -hmm. that's quite okay. the case. Uh, you know what's really funny is that uh, everybody miscalculated the uh, miscalculated Assad, the Assad regime in uh, in Syria, and somehow there's a feeling that Assad is vindicated because now everybody's rallying to fight Assad's enemies. Um, you know, this problem might just be too big enough for the West, you know, Europe and uh, and the U.S. together. I think it's time for the Indias, the China, the Russia of this world to join Western forces and fight, the, fight these, um, these terrorist uh, non-wanted elements, um, sorry, unwanted elements. If, if, if the BRICS can emerge or want to emerge as a global power group, I think they should also share global responsibility. Yes, I agree. We're going to take another break, if you don't mind, Gauri. We, we'll come back and I... I'd like to ask you about something we haven't talked about yet, namely Russia and the Ukraine, and how people in Europe see that one. It's unbelievable we could cram all this in such a 45-minute show. <laughs> anyway, that's Gauri Kandakar. She's with Free Day. Free Day is a, a think tank in uh, Madrid and Brussels. We talked to her by Skype, 12 hours difference, um, here on West of Asia in the Think Tech Talks, talking about storms of another kind. We'll be right back. I'm Hong Jiang, host for Asia in Review on Tuesdays. And I'm David Day, host for Asian Review on Thursdays. Both of us broadcast our respective shows at 4 p.m. And my topics tend to deal with uh, questions related to environment, culture, history, and sometimes human rights. And my shows tend to be on international business, foreign policy, geopolitics, and national security. And you can watch our shows live on the ThinkTech website at thinktechhawaii.com. And uh, you can also watch us on YouTube or Alalo. So come join us on Thursdays at 4 p.m. I'm David Day. And on Tuesdays at 4 p.m., I'm Hong Jiang. Aloha. Aloha. So clear in my memory, too, you know? <laughs> Here we are, West of Asia, with Gauri Kandakar. She's with Free Day, F R I D E, which is a think tank in Madrid and Brussels, and kind enough to join us even late at night in Brussels to talk about the European view of storms of another kind happening in a, in a troubled world. Uh, so uh, where we left it, Gary, was uh, uh, something we hadn't talked about, namely the Ukraine. You know, yeah. Western Europe's not that far from the Ukraine. When you're talking about something in Syria, that's pretty distant, I guess. Yeah. But the Ukraine is your, is your doorstep. So how do people feel about that? They must be very threatened by what Russia's doing. Exactly true. People are more worried about Russia than they are about ISIS. <laughs> Sure. And, and, and Eastern European countries are really very scared because 
they're facing what is now uh, they see a resurgent Russia, a more um, pre-Cold War Russia. Uh, under Putin, Russia appears to be a much stronger, more aggressive uh, country than it, than it had become. Um, I have a feeling that Europe lives in it. Europe, since it's a postmodern entity, it feels the whole world is in a postmodern space. But that's not true. People still have, the countries that still have geopolitical interests, uh, and they do use force, uh, and that we can see everywhere else, if they don't use it in Europe itself. Now, the crisis started when uh, Ukraine wanted to uh, have this accession treaty to get closer to the European Union. Uh, now, Ukraine was the buffer, country, buffer zone between the EU and Russia. Seen from Russia's perspective, it seemed that Europe and NATO were getting closer and closer. This is Russia's perspective. From the EU perspective, it wants to spread its harmony and see uh, and getting uh, countries uh, in its own path of development and, and, and uh, prosperity, the country in paradise, if you mean. Uh, but this did not go down well with Russia, of course, and Russia um, invaded uh, and annexed Crimea, which was a Russian uh, base anyway, uh, given to uh, Ukraine uh, many years back. Now, since then, uh, there has been unrest in um, in Ukraine's eastern part, mainly Donetsk region, uh, where there are many Russian-speaking uh, people. The population feel uh, a very strong sense of Russian identity, and they would like to join the motherland, uh, if you may. Um, Putin, uh, as is alleged by European leaders, has been uh, supporting this unrest. There have been reports of uh, Russian forces uh, entering into Ukraine, uh, and this is quite true as well. Uh, and this is worrying, yes. Um, since then, there has been a war of sanctions. The EU started with its own sanctions against um, uh, movement of people, then movement, uh, then uh, against the uh, key enterprises. Russia retaliated with its own sanctions ban, uh, sanctions against them. Um, uh, uh, with a travel ban against European and American uh, key business and political leaders. And then um, the EU had another sanction uh, list imposed on, uh, on Russia, and Russia responded with the biggest uh, sanction it could to date uh, for now is, uh, is a ban on agricultural products, uh, meat and dairy. And this is really harming European interests. Um, I think the, the Polish farmers in particular who sell the majority of their apples to Russia uh, or, or Western European countries who sell meat to Russia are quite impacted. And so this climate of sanctions, uh, war and, uh, and rhetoric, war rhetoric has been going on. Now, what the Europeans realize is that they really have no other means to uh, oppose Putin. Uh, except for sanctions, nobody is going to fight Ukraine. NATO summit has also talked about creating a 5,000 uh, personnel strong um, troops, a mobile unit, uh, which could be deployed within 48 hours in, in Eastern Europe, but only for uh, NATO allies. Um, but then there are also news of Putin having de deployed 20,000 <laughs> troops on, on Ukraine's border. So how can you compete? So this is this is what uh, Europe is dealing with, and and it's uh, quite worrying. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's got all these pieces of history. You know, those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. George Santayana, one of my favorites, and and there's all these elements of history. For example, uh, back back in the old days, uh, I guess it was the uh, in the communist days, uh, the Russians did the same kind of thing, humanitarian trips into Ukraine, and it was really uh, the Trojan horse, because at the yes. end of the day, they took the place over. And now they're replaying the same play, the same way. And, and you wonder, I mean, P Putin has been in power for some time, um, lots of machinations behind the screen, but, you know, it seems to be a, a different program now. 
he is devolving this whole this whole uh, you know frontier into a, a cold war. He's creating uh, a return to the cold war. Why? Why would he do that? Why would he do it now? Why doesn't he just relax? You know, I really think that um, Russia sees that it has a protectorate state. It needs this buffer zone, which was Ukraine, or which is still hopefully a unified Ukraine. And if you see from Russia's point of view, it does see NATO and the whole North Atlantic alliance, you know, inching closer and closer. And this is Russia's way of feeling secure. Now, Russia does, Putin in particular, um, it, it has become a, uh, an ego game for him. Uh, and and if, you, if you've noticed, his popularity ratings are the highest ever he's ever got. Um, so it's, it's become a more of a prestige issue for him. He cannot back down. And, and the EU really made a mistake in, 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 in opening up uh, to Ukraine very quickly. It, it, uh, and this is what most of the, some of the leaders have been saying as well in, in the European Parliament, in various member states, that perhaps uh, it was the EU that caused the bloodshed because it knew that it, Putin was never going to let go of, of Ukraine. And it was just uh, poking a, a sleeping giant in a yeah. way. Well, it just strikes me that uh, NATO doesn't come out of this very well. NATO come out, comes out uh, weak. And frankly, the U.S., uh, which really has said it's not going to do anything about anything here, uh, also comes out weak. And at the end of the day, it looks like, uh, you know, if you're aggressive and you play this kind of uh, Cold War game, you can have what you want. This is not going to help world peace. But you know, it's, uh, it's choosing a battle as well. Now, Putin is only fighting this battle while uh, the West is, uh, is really concerned with Ebola, ISIS, Libya, Syria, the world affairs, you know, uh, bringing world peace, uh, as a, as a, as a pagan would say. Um, so it's right that NATO uh, would not take on Ukraine's battles because Ukraine is not a part of NATO. Uh, today, President Obama, uh, in, uh, when he was in Wales, he assured uh, Estonia, for instance, which is one of the Baltic states, uh, that no harm would come to them, that, uh, that NATO would really ensure their safety and security. So I, I really think that if, if it comes to that, NATO would be very effective. And it really does, um, does uh, have a lot of potential uh, and and I and I think even if it were to be Russia, uh, NATO would 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 uh, would really counter Russia if if it came to a NATO member state. Mm -hmm. Okay. What well, last item before we uh, run out of time, Gary? Uh, there are other items on the list, but I just want to uh, deal with the Ebola outbreak in in Africa. Oh. Lord knows Africa has had its troubles in the last uh, few years, but this one this one is threatening to everyone. Uh, in a number of countries in Africa, and I wonder how people in Europe feel about the Ebola outbreak. Are they a Are they concerned for their own country and you know and their own health? And b Are they uh, moved to uh, ac actually provide uh, health assistance? Uh, Lord knows it's uh, hard to go into an infected area when you know the the healthcare providers themselves are at such great risk, which is, makes this so problematic. Um, but what, what is the European view of the Ebola outbreak in Africa? Well, um, yes, people have been worried. Um, uh, flights have been halted between uh, Ebola-affected countries and Europe. Uh, I think uh, Air France was the last one uh, to not uh, do it, but then it has. Uh, if, you must, if you remember, there were some protests as well uh, when an Ebola patient was brought to the UK for treatment. Now, uh, the Spanish priest that caught uh, Ebola in Liberia was brought to Madrid, and he was the first European to contract Ebola and, 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 and be brought back uh, to Europe. But he, he sadly passed away in, in, in Madrid. Um, but the EU has been quite uh, hands-on. It has uh, committed almost 12 million euros. 
um, which is about $15 million to, to support the affected countries and its in channels to various uh, health organizations. Um, it has also deployed experts to the affected countries and allocated two mobile laboratories. Now, with the death toll that's increasing to 1,900 uh, today, I, I really think it's, it's a serious case, uh, and I don't think Europe can remain protected or isolated for for quite long if if the crisis is not stemmed back uh, back uh, in, in 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 Africa, in its, uh, and they don't have the, the the resources to deal with it. Yeah. Well, you know, Africa has a lot of travel with uh, Asia, I'm sorry, with Africa, um, and the incubation period for Ebola is, I recall, 21 days. So you stand at a certain risk that, uh, you know, this, this contagion could reach Europe any time. That's why I feel that uh, we need to schedule another show in roughly 21 days so we can check back and see what happened, uh, you know, more on the same story. That's Gary Kondakar, our <laughs> correspondent in Brussels. We'd love to talk to her. She's with Free Day, which is a think tank in Madrid and Brussels, and she stays up late to talk to us, and we are so gratified. Thank you so much, Gary. Thanks for having me, Dave. We'll talk again soon. Aloha. <laughs>